welcome to Elevate. Um, this is my second year in a row. And last year, I was um, very fortunate to host a very wonderful leader. And this year, I'm going to share a little bit of my own journey. Um, I lead uh, core data services for Target. And in a nutshell, that is data and services that, pro that are backbone for our customer service, so um, customer experience. So think about it as item, price, promo, risk and compliance, clearance, um, just the backbone, like I said. But what does it mean for Target? Um, it's $80 billion of reg price decisioning that my team does, or $6 billion of inventory that goes through clearance or a 300 million of uh, single day price offers that we did. Um, now that's huge and that's really impactful, but my team and I don't do this alone, right? We work very closely with our data science partners, our ops partners, our business partners, our product owners. One such business leader who I call a friend and a colleague and work closely with is Sirisha. Over to you, Sirisha. Thank you, Rupa. Um, this is, you know, Elevate is one of my favorite conferences. I look forward to it every year, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I lead the supply chain operations team. The scope of my team's work ranges across inventory management, sales and operations planning, supplier performance management, transportation, indirect and reverse logistics. Um, in, in a nutshell, we ensure that we have the right inventory at the right place at the right time so that our stores can serve our guests better. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better time than this to be in supply chain. Over the last few years, we have seen phenomenal growth. Um, Target grew by $35 billion. And to be able to s lead through that ambiguity and volatility um, and learn from that has been amazing. Um, and none of this would have been possible without strategic partners like Rupa and other leaders at Target. You know what Sirisha is not saying is her team moved $100 billion of inventory, which is, you know, which is huge. Um, but like she said, this happens with a lot of partnership and collaborations and the relationships you build that generate the next big idea or, you know, brainstorming or the next big impact for Target. Um, these relationships define or help you define your own career journeys. Um, when I speak about career journey, um, I have not seen uh, such an unconventional career journey as yours, Sirisha. I uh, would love for you to share it with the audience. Sure, thank you. Um, I, you know, there's this question that everybody asks in an interview, where do you see yourselves, you know, five years from now? How many of you have been asked that question and how many of you have an answer for that? Raise of hands, please. You do? <laughs> okay, not bad, you know. Um, honestly, I've been working for 20 plus years, I still don't have an answer for that. Um, that said, I have a lot of clarity on what I don't want to do. Everything else, I'm open for it, and I say bring it on. That's how from hotel management, I landed up in a finance job at GE, and from there I moved into risk at Dell, and then, you know, finance in Target. I was, overall, I was in finance for about 15 years. From there I moved to digital, and then from digital I moved into supply chain. Um, some of these roles were by choice, intentional career moves. Some of them were where the organization needed some help and I raised my hand, I said, I'll do that. So that's how I did all of that. But that doesn't mean I don't get nervous. I do get very nervous. You know, I have those butterflies in my tummy all the time, but those are the good, fun kind of butterflies that push you to do better, right? Um, so thanks to all these diverse career experiences, today I have a lot of confidence in, you know, to say, whatever that is, we will figure that out. What's the worst that can happen? Um, also, I have learned to have faith in the fact that every experience that you have gained in your career, every relationship that you have built, um, every learning that you have had leading up to that moment will set you up for success, and that's important. All of us have our own career journeys, so how about you? How have you approached your career? It's fascinating to hear your approach, right? Um, I know what I don't want to do. I think when I think back, my approach is I know what I want to do. And you know, by s no means I knew what role or what function or what you know, department or whether it's retail, not retail. Um, when I say that, I mean when I go to work on an everyday basis, what is it that I love to do? Um, I started my career as a developer. You know, after a few years sitting at my cube, coding away, I realized that you would find me in every huddle, in every brainstorming session, any whiteboarding, I'm usually surrounded with people trying to solve problems. And it may not be a problem assigned to me, you know, it doesn't matter. 
And so that made me think, this is what I love to do. And my you know, coding was there, but really was not my passion. Um, and so then it took me to figure out, how do I get there um, from, you know, this is where I want to be, um, looked around in the company, what role fits what I want to do, and then having to figure out you know, how to get there. We are making it sound very easy. <laughs> you know, that's about between us, 40 years of experience, 40 plus years. Um, did you ever feel like giving up or quitting? Balancing these priorities at home and at work are not easy. So talk to us about that. I know it's funny that uh, I, I did make it sound very easy. And no, it took me four years, um, believe me, from the time I decided what to do to actually start doing. Um, so it, it was work and it was time and investment. Um, but speaking of career breaks, how many of you have here thought about you know, taking a break, pausing, you know, making different choices? A lot of you, I see a lot of raised hands. Uh, believe me, I have thought of it uh, a lot of times. And um, you know, every time my son comes back with his report card, believe me, that's the first thing in my mind, right? Like, you know, maybe you know, if I take a break, his grades are going to skyrocket and you know, I'll feel really good. <laughs> this is a working mom thing, you know, guilt feel. But you know, my husband reminds me all the time um, that working moms, kids are as successful as others. and. Uh, you know, he's going to figure it out and, you know, working moms have a good positive impact. So I have to, you know, I, it, that helps me and I have to keep thinking myself that my career journey is my own and I have to figure out how to, um, you know, invest in my career. Um, initially, uh, when I started my career, I would compare my career with my boss's career. Um, she and I share our birthday month. She's two years um, old, younger th than me. And every time she got a promotion, I think I got a little depressed. I was like, you know, you're, you know, here I am, same age, and she is, you know, going up, and I'm right here, and what's going on? And so that went on, you know, for some time before it took me um, a while to figure out that, you know, what her career journey is her own. You know, my journey took me from India to U.S. I had to relearn a lot of things, fit into a new culture build my career the way I wanted. And, you know, here I am. Um, she still is a big inspiration to me, but, um, you know, you, you have to build your own career journey. Um, and at some point, ask for what you, you know, what you want to do uh, after you figure out what you want to do. Um, I think that's, you know, that's my career journey. But, uh, you know, I have seen you advocate for yourself um, really well all these years, uh, Siresha. What's your approach? Sure, you know, for a second there when you talked about report cards, like my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> my little one has her third grade examinations coming up, and I cannot tell you how stressed I am. The struggle is real, trying to balance between that and then, you know, a project that my team is working on where we need to save $60 million, you know. <laughs> so I digress. Anyway, talking about advocating for yourself, um, Rupa, I learned it the hard way. Here's what happened. For quite some point in my career, I used to keep getting this feedback that I need to be more confident. Now, people who know me know that I cannot be any more confident than I am already, <laughs> because then, you know, I'll be seen as an overconfident, you know, character, right? So it was very tough for me to understand where that was coming from, um, what do they mean by confidence, um, and that feedback would frustrate me a lot because I did not know what to do about it. And then I attended this you know, training development program, talent development program, wherein I got a coach. And this coach, over multiple conversations, you know, made me realize that I don't advocate for myself at all. And that is what is seen as lack of confidence. Um, of course, there's no looking back after that. <laughs> but here's what happened, right? I have learned through the process that advocating for yourself doesn't mean boasting or talking about yourself. It's about having the confidence and being able to clearly call out what you need, what you want, and also having the ability to make choices that affect you. And that's really important, right? A lot of people around us want to help. Thank you. A lot of people around us want to help us. It's just that they do not know how to help us till we ask, right? And that's important. How about you, Rupa? What have you... Um, you know, how has your journey been? Have you always been a great advocate for yourself? Or <laughs> I think I should tell a, a, an incident early on in my career um, that tells where I, you know, where I started from. Um, so I did move to U.S. and I would go to the coffee shop and I would ask for latte, extra hot, no foam, and I would get latte, extra hot, more foam. You know, a lot of foam. <laughs> 
and I would take it and I'll come back to my desk. And that went on for a week, um, and I would be depressed. You know, I would be like, "What's going on? Why? You know, why is this happening to me? Is it racism? Is it this, that? You know, all kinds of things, right?" Um, and one day when I was coming back to my desk, I met a friend of mine and she was like, come back, you know, I, let's go figure it out. And she took me back, talked to the barista saying, you know, uh, she didn't get what she asked for. And the barista was, you know, super apologetic. And she was like, oh, I, I thought you said latte, extra hot, more foam. So I've been adding more foam. And I'm here thinking I've been saying no foam and I've been miserable for a week. Um, and we've been, you know, friends after there for 15 years. but. For me, it was more like, had I asked the day, day one, I would have got what I wanted. Uh, instead of being miserable and also having all these thoughts about why this is happening with me, why I did not get what I wanted, and things like that. Um, so uh, since then, I think I've been a little bit more vocal. Um, but I also want to call, you know, say this, that it doesn't mean that every time I raise my hand and ask for something, I'm going to get it. Um, but the thing is, I at least know why I did not get it. or what does it mean to get there? And that was an unlock for me. Um, question to audience, actually. How many of you have the fear of speaking or fear of being wrong? Actually, somebody told me, what if I speak and I was wrong? I'm wrong. Um, have not expressed your opinion. See, quite a few. Yeah, it's, it's true, you know. Um, a lot of us have good opinions. However, we choose to remain silent. And I keep wondering, does that come from self-doubt, um, right? Self-doubt that's also amplified by people around you. Um, self-doubt that's amplified by the social conditioning that you've had growing up. It could be anything, right? Talking about social conditioning, here's something that happened very recently at home. Um, my little one, Naina, who, is, who just turned nine, um, wanted to have a play date with one of her friends. So we invited this other kid who is eight home. Um, and then they were playing, it's a Saturday, I was reading my book, they were playing. And then my husband comes home from work, he goes into the kitchen and he's serving food for himself. So this little one comes running to me and she's like, auntie, uncle is in the kitchen. Um, so I thought maybe he spilled something. I looked and I said, everything is fine. So I said, yes, he's in the kitchen. And she's like, he's doing something. I said, yes, he's eating. Um, we went back, you know, nothing happened. I was, yeah, I did not give it much thought. After a couple of hours, Baran comes down again, he goes into the kitchen, and you know, he's making coffee. And this little, little one comes to me again, and she's like, auntie, uncle is in the kitchen. I'm like, yes. You know, I, it did not register why she's saying that, right? So I said, yes. Um, and then she's like, I said, he's making coffee. She's like, he was there before too. I said, yes, he was eating. And then she's like, but he's in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, where is this conversation going, right? I said, yes, he knows how to eat, he knows how to make coffee. And then she almost said something like, shouldn't you be doing that or shouldn't you be there, right? Of course, this is an eight-year-old, you know, super cute, all of that, right? But I think that's when it hit me that, you know, this eight-year-old has never seen anybody other than a woman in the kitchen. And it was shocking to her that, you know, I'm almost not doing my job and Baran is in the kitchen, <laughs> you know, fending for himself, right? Um, in, in, in as much as, you know, I laugh about it, it also made me uh, think deeply. Everything that we are doing, talking about DEI at work, if that doesn't translate to how we behave at home, our future generations do not have much hope, um, right? And that's, that, yeah, that is worrisome, right? We need to, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We need to challenge these patriarchal norms that we are used to, and we need to model our behavior everywhere, not just at work. Um, and, and that's super critical. We need to be role models at the end of the day. We were joking about it, right? Um, so Sirisha and I were joking that elevate success is not needing elevate. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, but till you hear these kind of stories, um, you know, this makes us think that there is a lot to change, and this is why we are here. And that being the role model, not just for your own kids, maybe your neighbors and friends' kids, for your team, for your you know, maids and drivers and people who are around you, being that role model is super, super important. Yeah, I, I see that we have our cue. We are almost at the end of our segment. Here is what I would like to say to summarize this, right? My um, maybe top three life learnings, and I hope that they serve you well, and you know, Rupa would do the same. Um, one. What I, we don't have to figure out everything on our own. There are people who've been there who have done that. It's important to reach out, 
leverage the, those experiences, learn from them, and then, you know, lean on your tribe. That's, that's what I would say. The other one is careers are nonlinear. Um, if given an opportunity to choose between mm -hmm. learnings versus a title, um, I would always pick learnings, and I think that's what gives you a really fulfilling and you know enriching career at the end of the day. Um, and the last, you know, the last one that I'd say that I'd leave you with today is um, ensure that you know you are managing your inner voice with a lot of confidence and conviction, um, and ensure that you are your biggest advocate. Um, yeah, well said. Um. Great, great piece of advice, uh, Sirisha. I'll just add a little bit. Um, I think, you know, I personally, I believe everyone needs to invest in their career. And when we say invest in your career, be intentional about it, and that directly translates to investing in you. Uh, as a woman, I can tell you, when I was a new mom, I was killing myself, trying to do my job, running around, commuting. I used to take a train to work, like everything. And at one point, I had to just pause and say, for next two years, what's my priority? You know, giving up my career was not an option, but helping me sustain my life was an option, right? I spent half of my salary on, you know, childcare, cook, clean, whatever I needed. Um, and, you know, it's okay. I didn't get, you know, I wasn't going for a promotion. I wasn't, I just wanted to make sure I'm still invested in a career. That's a long run. That's a 20, 25 year thing. Um, at the same time, I'm there for my uh, child and get through the phase of life that needs you to prioritize 100 things that, you know, in a day. Um, I do believe that the tone that you initially set uh, about your career is what your ecosystem, you know, will um, also take it. By that, I mean that if your ecosystem, which is, you know, your in-laws, your parents, your friends, your teammates, your, uh, you know, your boss, um, get it that you are so passionate about it and that you really care about it, you get the same support back. Um, so, you know, don't make it a second, make it equal to every other priority. Initially, I said I have uh, core data services, which is six different pillars. Not one day, you know, I spend all my time on all of them, plus my home, plus my kids. One day it would be 150% on price, the next day could be 100% on item, and the third day would be something else. And the fourth day actually would be a project that my daughter just told me that it's due tomorrow, right? Um, so it, it's, it's a balancing act. But nowhere in the balancing act, one thing is more important than the other. The priority on the day-to-day -day changes, but my career is a priority as much as everything else, including the school project. I think that tone in it from the initial part of your career helps you sustain it for a really long time and be successful. Um, just also adding, we are at a tech conference. But I also want to say that technology career is not one thing, right? There are so many facets to it. You could be a data scientist, you could be a product owner, a program manager, a UX designer, a developer, an architect. Um, figure out what is it that you really want to do, um, you know, find your passion, and then invest and build on it. On that note, I think, uh, you know, we want to thank you all for joining us and listening to us. And have a successful, you know, career journey of your own. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.